I'm going to talk about this book that, that I really love a lot. I'll talk personally why I love it so much, a little bit. You know, it's, uh, it's, uh, I understand that this is like, we're here to talk as writers, right? And the things we identify with as writers. So um, this book and this writer, in particular Naipaul, were important to me uh, at, from the start of my career as a writer. Um, uh, uh, it, partly because, um, you know, in, 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 in the most simple way, I wanted to do what he was doing. You know, I come from, my family comes from Guatemala, part of my family. I very much, uh, as I, I came out of uh, university, you know, wanting to be a writer precisely when uh, all, uh, everything was exploding in Central America, and I understood that somehow uh, that was going to be my path to, to connect to these two places that I was from, uh, the United States and Central America. Uh, uh, I wanted to have the sort, I thought back then, I want, and look, here I am still a little bit that doing that. You know, that, you know, I admired, I wanted to be able to do somewhat, something like what he had done where, uh, uh, and is still doing, you know, writing novels and being a journalist. Uh, um, even as I, I, I began to try to understand Central America and Guatemala, uh, I admired his journalism so much. I love, I admired him so uh, for his obviously his eye, his intelligence, his sense of history, his 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 uh, utter lack of romantic romanticism, his skepticism. Uh, uh, he meant a lot to me as a journalist, and he did in fact uh, write about. Uh, even Central America. He has a wonderful chronicle of going to Guatemala, even, you know, where he has a, uh, he's very <laughs> mystified by how strange Guatemala is, because Guatemala really is strange. It's not like anybody's <coughs> stereotype of a Latin American country who have never been there. He describes going into the airport and the strange, you know, vegetables and fruits in their big jars of vinegar, and uh, the woman looking Chinese to him which are the indigenous women, of course. And, uh, um, you know, so f from the start, I just paid such careful attention to, to, to the kind of writing he was doing, even when later on, I think I've written one really serious book of nonfiction, which was called The Art of Political Murder, uh, 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 which is about uh, following the, the, the story of the murder of Bishop Juan Gerardi in Guatemala. And at the time, I'm always asked what, you know, it's very much narrative, but very detailed and takes the examination incredibly, the criminal examination, very seriously. It's where I learned to do things that still serve me very well now. Like, I love to read through uh, witness statements and, you know, the, just all the, the thick, raw data of criminal trials uh, and find narratives there. And... Um, when I was writing the book, I was often asked, you know, what was your model for that book? And everybody, you know, was it, um, you know, in, in true, in cold blood? And actually, in cold blood's a book I detest. It's it's it, 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 it's fictionalizations are so obvious to me. The narcissism of the writer behind it is so obvious to me. Um, the book I always say was only really, and, and and people assume there must be many books, but it was, there was really only one, and that was the Michael X murders in Trinidad by V.S. Naipaul. No, which was also just very forensic, very detailed, very just relentlessly chasing down the, the story of this, this very politically charged murder. Um, I love, in this book, as in, in, in so many other, of certain other of his books, like A Bend in the River, I love the climate of uh, the world of merchants, the world of things. My family in Guatemala, they're store owners. No, and so I've always just loved that sense of, 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 you know, your stake in the world is so important. You can be so easily in these countries obliterated. History could just change and just wipe you out. Uh, and somehow owning, you know, buying and selling, you know, is sort of the most stable thing you can do, right? And just the, uh, the incredible value attached to, uh, you know, owning something and, and, and the, the fundamental act of selling things and 
putting them back, you know, and getting money back for them, and, and all the stress involved in that. And, and just that, like, you know, just that, that really tangible culture you find in him. Like when I read in here and just read really simple things, like the descriptions of the warehouse at back of the, in the, uh, the Tulsi store. I just remember hours of like being back there as a little boy, wandering around the labyrinth of the, of the smelly, you know, uh, uh, back room warehouses of my family's, our family stores in Guatemala City. And, you know, I just have always um, uh, loved that sense, you know. And, and I mean, I think he really, you know, uh, the famous first line to bend in the river, right? You know, the world is what it is, you know. Um, you know, men who are nothing, who allow themselves to become, to become nothing, have no place in it. And it describes this man making a journey to a village where he's just going to open a shop. You know? <laughs> it's, uh, and that's having a stake in allowing yourself to be someone in the world. Um, in, these wor in these places where people can so often be just turned, seemingly feel like they could be annihilated at any moment, right, by political upheaval. Uh, by weather, you know, by, 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 by the uh, you know, sudden changes in, in history. Um, I, 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 but, but most of all, uh, the reason that I, uh, I love this book is because of the portrait of the father, right? It's, uh, I'm obsessed with my father. I can't get over my awe at the profusion of life with which, in detail and verbal energy, uh, I, 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 I just pure, you know, pure fictional mastery and energy with which he goes back and recreates, for instance, the years of his father's childhood, right? Back in the trace. I mean, it's, you can understand more the years in which he's, after Anand is born, this is the Via Snipo version of himself, right? That he's, uh, you can understand that, but I mean, I just so, I find it just so extraordinary the way he brings those, 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 you know, that hard, hard yet teeming life that his father was born into, you know, to life, right? And of course, you know, the book itself is kind of a picturesque, right? It's comic from the start, calling Mr. Biswas Mr. Biswas, even from the time he's an infant announces that this is a comedy, essentially. A heartbreaking comedy, often, but a comedy, right? Mr. Biswas is one of those characters uh, who we are supposed to sort of feel a little condescending to. We revel in his, we revel in his blunders, his innocence, his awkwardness, his mistakes. We laugh at him, <coughs> right, at times, yet we begin to identify and sympathize with him deeply and of course there's a panoply of human values there that you can't help as a reader also you know he's noble right he for all his calamities he's ferociously uh, capable capable of ferocious love for his immediate family for all his um, uh, 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 for all his cal you know you know uh, you know, noisy endeavor, and 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 often uh, 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 really, f you know, truculent uh, outbursts and, and comical self-deceptions. There's a record of incredible anguish in there that runs through his whole life. I find myself constantly feeling pierced by that sense of him of of just fear of the future, right? And fear of what can happen and fear of being annihilated any second, which I find such a, a deep quality of, of, of third world life. But all of, sometimes in some of our cases, you know, it's, I think I feel like it's something that always haunts me, <laughs> you know? And um, uh, uh, I love the sense in him of, uh, you know, you see certain recurring words in the book like that, that are really um, Nepalian themes in all of Naipaul, uh, you know, that sense of growing up in a place defined by such strict limits, right? And not being able at first, and this is what the book sort of rediscovers, right? You know, to feel yourself so confined in a place nobody cares about, uh, you know, an old tropical backwater, 
uh, defining everything that suggests escape from that place as desirable and as romance, right? He's constantly referring to the romance of things, right? Something promises romance, something suggests romance. And, um, and, and of course, the grown-up versions of Naipaul's characters discover that there is really no romance, right? And romance becomes something like, you know, uh, you know, this version of Dickens London they all carry around in their heads eventually, right? Whereas eventually in the writing of this book, and eventually he realizes that this is a world as teeming as, 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 as uh, easily as teeming as Dickens' London, you know? And it's full of, of many of the same uh, 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 social, you know, complexities, very, very much uh, local ones, right? Um, you know, I just, I, I, you know, as for, uh, just the, you know, it's just the pure writing. I could start almost anywhere, but I found myself I know, a few days ago. Just, just, you know, this little scene just struck me. It had a, a bunch of things I, I really just loved. Going from page, hmm, you know, sixty-four to, to uh, the the visit when he f discovers his sister. You know, he's decided that um, um, <coughs> that he, you know, he doesn't want to be lent out. To the, he's lent out almost like a little Dickensian orphan boy by his impoverished mother to various people who hire him to do things, right? And he suffer, He decides like it's going to be a trait of Mr. Biswas's where they're going to call, you know, they're going to call him the canoe paddler because he says, "I want to paddle my own canoe," and they're going to mock him for his, uh, you know, for his ambition always, and and. Um, he sets out looking for a job, right? Which is a very wonderful, uh, you know, one, 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 on Monday morning he set about looking for a job. How did one look for a job? He supposed that one looked. He walked up and down the main road looking. He passed the tailor and tried to picture himself cutting cocky cloth, tacking and operating a sewing machine. He passed a barber and tried to picture himself stropping a, a razor. His mind wandered off to devise elaborate protections for his left thumb. He didn't like the tailor he saw, a fat man sulkily sewing in a dingy shop. And as for the barbers, he had never liked those who cut his own hair. He thought, too, how it would disgust Pundit Khairam to learn that his former pupil had taken up barbering, a profession immemorially low. He walked on. It's a, it, this is a wonderful you know, evocation of the, of, of the Trinidadian you know, small, small business, uh, backwards village. He gets very discouraged. Um, he <laughs> Mr. Briscoe returned to the back trace, his resolution shaken. I am not going to take any job at all, he told Bip D, that's his mother. Why don't you go and make it up with Tara? She's the local rich lady who he's fought with, who he'd been hired out to. I don't want to see Tara. I'm going to kill myself. That would be the best thing for you and for me. Good, good. I don't want any food. And in a great rage, he left the hut. Wonderful scene where he sees his sister, uh, the Houthi, pick up his dirty, smelly shirt and hold it over her face, and she starts crying into it. Right? And then, uh, so then she's married off. She leaves because she can't stand Tara either. And he hasn't seen her for a long time. I just find this scene, this is the scene when he runs into her husband, just so full of like all the things Naipaul can convey, all the complex, unexpected little emotionally or sometimes in, you know so devastatingly insightful uh, things that he could portray just through, through the through the art of incredibly observant uh, and secretly busy underneath the surface busy you know realist writing you no know, it's uh, they come to the, the house right that his sister absolutely is now living in uh, his sister who supposedly is married you know even into a lower situation than the one, you know, and they, than the one that, were, that, that surrounds Mr. Biswas. The hut indicated lowness in no way. The mud walls had been freshly whitewashed and decorated with blue and green and red palm prints. Mr. Biswas recognized Ramchand's broad palm and stubby fingers. The thatch was new and neat. The earth floor was high and had been packed hard. Pictures from calendars were stuck on the walls, and in the veranda there was a hat rack. It was altogether less depressing than the crumbling, neglected hut in the back trace. 
but it seemed to the, that to Dehute, marriage had brought no joy. The first of like these incredibly complex, uh, 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 joyless seeming marriages that we get throughout the book, right? None more, more so than Mr. Biswas's the Shama. But it seemed that to, uh, uh, she was uneasy at being caught among her household possessions and tried to hint that they had nothing to do with her. When Ransham started to point out some attractive feature of the hut, she sucked her teeth and desisted. Mr. Beswas couldn't believe that the Huti had ever spoken about him, as Ramshad had said. She hardly spoke, hardly looked at him. Without expression, she brought out an ugly baby from an inner room asleep and showed it, suggesting at the same time that she had not brought it out to show it. She looked careworn and sulky, untouched by her husband's bubbling desire to please. Yet in her unharried way, she did what she could to make Mr. Biswas, Mr. Biswas welcome. He understood that she feared rebuff and the reports he might take back, and this made him uncomfortable. The Hoti never pretty was now frankly ugly. Her Chinese eyes looked sleepy, the pupils without a light, the whites smudged. Her cheeks, red with pimples, bulged low and drooped around her mouth. Her lower lip projected as though squashed out by the weight of her cheeks. She sat on a low bench, the back of her long skirt caught tightly between her calves and the back of her thighs, the front draped over her knees. Mr. Biswas was surprised by her adulthood. It was the way she sat, knees apart, yet so decorously covered. He had associated that only with mature women. He tried to find in the woman the girl he had known, but seeing her growing needlessly impatient while Ramchand, at her instructions, lit the fire and prepared to boil the rice, Mr. Biswas felt that this sight of the Huti had wiped out the old picture. This was a loss. It added to the unhappiness he had begun to feel as soon as he entered the hut. Ranchan came out from the kitchen and sank in the most relaxed way onto the earth floor. He stretched out in one short trousered leg and held his hands around this upright knee. I love that sentence because it's so simple. You know, and sometimes when we write, I, at least I, you know, you, you have in your mind the picture of somebody in a posture and that posture seems to communicate so much. And when you actually try and write it, you know, and you picture it in your mind like, like, like one of the great you know, masters of painting will do just these fantastic, simple line drawings. You know, just try sometimes. A sentence like that can be so hard to write, to get that simple line. No, I find, right, the way, and, 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 and he's just a master, both in the, in the facial expressions and the postures. Um, uh, it's, uh, contemporary writers, I, don't, I can't think of anyone else who does it. I mean, they're not contemporary anymore, really. I was gonna say Bello, especially saw Bello with faces, right? What Bello can do with a face. I think uh, uh, often uh, um, uh, uh, Naipaul can do it, just the whole human body, right? And, um, the corrugations of his thick hair glinted with oil. He asked Mr. Biswas to read the writing on the calendar pictures and the Sunday school cards and listened in pure pleasure while Mr. Biswas did so. You are going to be a great man, Ramchand said, a great man reading like that at your age. Used to hear you reading those things to Ahoja, et cetera. That's a theme that's gonna reverberate throughout the book, right? As it reverberated throughout Naipaul's own life and his own relationship to his own father, right? This pressure to be great. Mr. Biswas's self-imposed, almost in some ways ludicrous, right? It, 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 it so deeply felt aspiration and conviction that greatness was within his reach, which then, of course it's not, in the ways he meant it, though I think the son would say it was there in other ways, and the way he passes that on to his son as both, as a very complicated gift and burning burden, which is really at the bottom of this book, right? And this is like the first time that theme is sort of introduced, you know. Uh, not finished with these decorations, he said, pointing to the walls. Get him some more of those Sunday school pictures. Jesus and Mary, eh, Dehuti? Laughing. I mean, it's just the, you know, that, 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 you know, pure village peasant, you know, uh, crudeness of it all, right? Laughingly, he 
flung the matchstick he had been chewing at the baby. Dehuti closed her eyes in annoyance, puffed out her pimply cheeks a little more and turned her face away. The matchstick fell harmlessly on the baby. Making some improvements too, Ramchan said. Come. This time Dehuti did not suck her teeth. They went to the back and Mr. Buiswa saw another room being added to the hut. Trim tree but tr branches had been buried in the earth. The rafters of lesser boughs were in place. Between the uprights, the bamboo had been pla plated. The earth floor was raised, but not yet packed. Extra room, Ramchan said. When it is finished, you can come and stay with us. Mr. Buswas's depression deepened. <laughs> I mean, just the way these people, you know, I mean, I mean the Ramchans are like, Ramchan's a great husband, right? <laughs> He's like doing what a man should do. Something that is going to be beyond poor Mr. Biswas's abilities almost to the end of his life, right? Till finally he gets his house. It's, uh, they went on a tour of the small hut, Ramchan pointing out the refinements he had added. Shelves set in the mud, walls, tables, chairs. Back in the veranda, Ramchan pointed to the hat rack. There were eight hooks on it, symmetrically arranged about a diamond-shaped glass. That is the only thing here I don't, didn't make myself. The Huti set her heart on it. He slept down on the floor again and flung the little ball of earth he had been rolling between his fingers at the baby. <laughs> the Huti closed her eyes and pouted. Me? I didn't want it. I wish, you would stop, I wish you would stop running around giving people the idea that I have modern ambitions. <laughs> the hat rack, right? <laughs> he laughed uneasily and scratched his bare leg. The nails left white marks. I have no hat to hang on a hat rack, the Huti said. I don't want a mirror to show me my ugly face. Ramcham scratched and winked at Mr. Biswas. Ugly face? Ugly face? The Huti said, I don't stand up in front of the hat rack combing my hair for hours. The hair is not pretty and curly enough. Ramcham accepted the compliment with a smile. In the veranda, black and yellow light and the light of the oil lamp, they sat down on low benches to eat. But although he was hungry, and although he knew that both the Huti and Ramcham had mu much affection for him, <coughs> Mr. Biswas found that his belly was beginning to rise and hurt, and he couldn't eat. Their happiness, which he couldn't share, had upset him. Right? This was a portrait of, of happiness, right? Marriage, you know, in a house that's actually moving somewhere. And, and just the incredibly complex, you know, comical, painful ways in which the Houthi hides her love, show, by, shows her love by hiding her love, I guess. Right? It's just like something that's so, you know, just masterfully, concretely depicted, right? So, of course, eventually, you know, the great relationship at the heart of this book is Mr. Biswas's marriage to Shama, which I'm sure you all have a lot to say about. I just, you know, Shama's so obviously a portrait of Mr. Biswas, of Naipaul's own mother. And Mr. Biswas is just, I mean, you can all tell me. I mean, Mr. Biswas, when he goes to live at Hanuman House, I mean, what? Comedy. It's just incredible, right? <laughs> you know, the, 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 the horrible Tulsis, right? It is, you can see a lot of people would be thrilled to be there, especially if you're coming from this horrible, impoverished village where you owe nothing. He's been accepted. I mean, it really is such a Dickensian situation. It's a, it's a bleak house, sort of, you know, you know, you know, comedic, like more, you know more, more hyper and comedic situation. I mean, she is really a piece of work, right? This is Tulsi. And, and the way she just like, they birthed daughters and gotten fine husbands so that they can be employed and exploited and the house is just so clamorous with children and, 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 and it's such a crazy hierarchy. And Mr. Biswas, who's, so, who's perceived by everybody to be so weak and so cowardly and so contemptuous, you know, so, so, demer so deserving of contempt, and he is in some ways, <laughs> is yet so noble. Right when he's constantly rebelling against this and and, 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 and and saying he wants no part of it and and asserting his individuality, right, his, his autonomy, and plunging his wife into a, you know into is it just what for her are just hopeless situations one after another, you know because she just wants to be there among her sisters with the baby she thinks it's great, right, and 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 and, and uh, I just love just this scene which just holds the the seed of tenderness within them, because I mean, you all know the incredible comedy of how they first meet, right? 
And, uh, and anyways, he's become a sign painter. And I just love the tenderness in this scene, which foretells we're going to see so much rancor. We're going to see so many horrible things happen between them before. Though the marriage is, of course, one for all its up and downs that beautifully endures. You know? and, uh, um, and he's so in this world of hard men who are planters and work out and do manly things in the outdoors. He really is so nebbishy, right? <laughs> And the scene just captures it so well, right? And she, you could tell Shama is just completely beguiled by him. She doesn't know what to make of her own husband. No, has no idea. She's, he is so not the man she dreamed of marrying. No, <laughs> and, who, if, if, and not that anyone in this world gets to marry the man they dreamed of marrying, but he's so unlike any of the other men, except maybe some of the intellectual pundits who finally he's relegated to their sort of intellectual world, but of course he's not a holy man at all. Uh, I got a name for any one of you, you know, he's constantly at war. I got a name for, oh, I'm sorry, 114. I got another name, I got a name for another one of your brother-in-laws. He told Shama that evening, lying on his blanket, his right foot and his left knee, peeling off a broken nail from his big toe. I just, lo I just love all the grossness. Yeah, the gross, everybody, it's, it's the tropics, it's poor people, everybody's just, Got rotted toes, you know, that's the way it is. <laughs> it's um, from his big toe. The constipated holy man. Harry, she said, and pulled herself up, realizing that she had begun to take part in the game. He slapped his yellow flabby calf and pushed his finger into the flesh. The calf yielded like a sponge. She pulled his hand away. Don't do that. I can't bear to see you do that. You should be ashamed, a young man like you being so soft. That is all the bad food I eating in this place. He was still holding her hand. Well, as a matter of fact, I have quite a few names for him. The Holy Ghost. You like that? Man. And what about the two gods? Did it ever strike you that they look like two monkeys? So you have one concrete monkey god outside the house and two living ones inside. They could just call this place the monkey house and finish. Eh? Monkey, bull, cow, hen. The place is a blasted zoo, man. And what about you? She goes back, the barking puppy dog, man's best friend. He flung up his legs and his thin slack calves shook. With a push of his finger, he kept the calves swinging. <laughs> Stop doing that. By now, Shama's head was on his soft arm and they were lying side by side. You know, it's so beautiful. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is how, this is how babies are going to get made. Eventually, because you're wondering with all the terrible things that happened between them, where did the one baby after another? <laughs> it's like, it's um, uh, this incredible. I mean, Shama is, you know, one of the classic, you know, portraits of, of emerging, you know, the, you know of, of tropical matriarchal strength, right? It's, uh, uh, we get some of those in Mexican literature. You know, they're the equivalent of the Jewish mothers in North American literature. Um, uh, uh, certainly Mexico, I, don't, my, I think my own family, obviously here, without the women, you know, <laughs> there would be not a hope, right? It's, uh, without, I just love this, uh, when they get exiled to that little shop, you no, know, because Mr. This was has acted up so much, he basically, be careful what you wish for. And they get thrown out of the compound and sent to this little sugarcane village and given a little, sh a horrible little shop to run in the, literally the middle of nowhere. Yeah, on page 138, I think it starts. And this scene I just find, again, just so incredibly powerful what it depicts about what Shama's gonna be from now through the rest of the book, all right? And it's, the different things she goes through when they come to this place. You know, they're in the shop, you know. It's the sort of place you could build up, Mr. Biswa said. His eyes became accustomed to the darkness and he looked about him. On the top shelf he saw some tins, apparently abandoned by the previous shopkeeper. About this person, Mr. Biswa was now, now began to speculate. There was ambition and <coughs> despair in these tins. Their faded labels had been nibbled by rats and stained by flies. Some tins had no labels at all. I moved down a paragraph. Shama started to cry, but this time she didn't cry silently, with the tears running down from her expressionless eyes. 
She sobbed like a child, leaning over the, count the box with the Japanese coffee set on the counter, which is her only wedding gift, this little Japanese coffee set. Um, you wanted this. You wanted to paddle your own canoe. In all my life, I never so shamed as today. People standing up and laughing. This is what you want to paddle your own canoe, your own canoe with? She covered her eyes with one hand and waved at the bundles on the counter with the other. He wanted to comfort her, but he needed comfort himself. How lonely the shop was and how frightening. He had never thought it would be like this when he found himself in an establishment of his own. It was late afternoon. Hanawin House would be warm and noisy with activity. Here he was af so afraid. Here he was afraid to disturb the silence, afraid to open the door of the shop, to step into the light. And in the end, it was Shama who gave him comfort. For presently, she stopped crying, gave a long, decisive blow to her nose, and began sweeping, setting up, putting away. He followed her about, watching, offering help, glad to be told to do something and enjoying it when she reproved him for doing it badly. In his careless retreat, the previous tenant had abandoned two articles of furniture to the Tulsis. These had helped passed on to Mr. Biswas. In one of the back rooms, there was a large canopyless cast iron four-poster whose black enamel paint was chipped and lackluster. Smell, Shama said, holding a bedboard to Mr. Biswas's nose. It had the piercing, acrid smell of bed bugs. She doused the boards with kerosene. It wouldn't kill the bugs, she said but it would keep them quiet for the time being. And this is one of the things I love that he does throughout this book, because he's constantly jumping ahead and from this very tight chronological focus in Mr. Biswas's life, jumping out to encompass all the time of the book, right? Which is all, of course, about this house, which we meet in the first paragraph, right? And the, the few things that are, you know, what's going to be carried through, through all of this narrative. Um, and for years, Mr. Biswas was to know particularly on a Saturday morning, the smell of kerosene and bud bugs. The boards changed, the mattress changed, but the bugs remained. Following the four-poster wherever it went, from the chase to Greenvale, to Port of Spain, to the house at Short Hills, and finally to the house in Seacom Street, where it neatly filled one of the two bedrooms on the upper floors. And then the other piece, and then to finish this paragraph, feeling grateful to Shama, he felt tender towards her coffee set. He was not prepared for such a change in himself. And then he was astonished at the change in Chama. To the last, he had protested at leaving, Hun uh, to the last, she had protested at leaving Hanuman House. But now she behaved as though she moved into a derelict house every day. Her actions were assertive, wasteful, and unnecessarily noisy. They filled shop and house. They banished silence <coughs> and loneliness. All right? There we see, like, Chama begins to come into her who she's going to be in different ways, you know, for the rest of the book. It's just so, I, I just find it so powerful and beautiful and intimate. Um, let me just quickly, a little collage of just little moments, right, that, that uh, the beginning of the, another, you know, the, the, you know, the discovery of the power of the story, right, which is first news, this first becoming a journalism, journalist, right, and moves on to these dreams of being a novelist. Right, it's uh, here's the first time this we get an inkling of this on page 161 after he's speaking to the local journalist, journalist, uh, Ms., uh, uh, Miser, or Miser, Miser, like Miser, right? And and uh, he realizes that news could be a story, can be a great tool for revenge, right? And they're talking, he goes, he, uh, at the top of 161, no, it's uh. Why are you asking? You don't really care. Nobody don't care. Just tell them a few fairy stories and they're happy. They don't want to face facts. And this Shivlochan is a damn fool. You know they send Peg Chek Rai back to India? Sometimes I stop and wonder what is happening to him over there. I suppose the poor man in rags, starving in some gutter, can't get a job or anything. You know, you could make a good story out of Peg Chag. Just what I was going to say. The man was a purist. A bored purist? Miser, are you still working for the Sentinel? Blasted sent the line still. Why? Damn funny thing happened today. You know what I see? A pig with two heads. <laughs> Where? Right here, Hanuman House, from their estate. But Hindus like the Tulsis wouldn't keep pigs. You would be surprised. Of course, it was dead. 
For all his reforming instincts, Miser was clearly disappointed and upset. Anything for the money these days. Still, is a story going to telephone it in straight away. And when he left Miser, Mr. Biswas said, occupation laborer, this will show them. Right? Because on the birth certificate, they put his name in his labor. Right? The first, his, first, his first news story <laughs> to humiliate the Tulsis. Um, this recurring things that always just, you know, this, these kinds of lines just burst into, into Mr. Biswas's consciousness totally throughout the book. And I think are, are like a, a, I really like what sort of flows like a, like a, you know, tunnel of wind underneath all of the narrative. The future he feared could not be thought of in terms of time. It was a blackness, a void like those in dreams, into which past tomorrow and next week and next year he was falling, right? That anxiety, it recurs and recurs and recurs. It's as much a part of, of Mr. Biswas as all of his noisy, cantankerous noisiness. Um, the horrible scene on page 184 where, where he hits Shama for the first time. He's always been, he's a, this is a culture where men hit women. And he's always been portrayed as, as somebody who wouldn't hit a woman. Not necessarily because he's so good because he's too timid and too afraid of the repercussions. <coughs> and you know, they have terrible rancor between them at times, right? And they spent their last two years at the chase in this state of mutual hostility at peace only in Hanuman House, curiously enough, right? Because every time he takes them away, it's to some nightmare situation. She became pregnant for the third time. Another one for the monkey house, he said, passing his hands over her belly. You had nothing to do with it. And though he had spoken humorously, this led to another serious quarrel which went over the same limited ground until, unable to control his rage, he hid her. They were both astonished. She was silenced in the middle of a sentence. For some time afterward, the unfinished sentence returned in his mind, as though it had just been spoken. She was stronger than he. Her silence and her refusal to retaliate made his humiliation complete. She dressed Anand. Little V.S. Naipaul has been born by that, and went to Arwakas. It was kite flying season. And in the afternoons, when the wind came from the hills to the north, for miles around, multicolored kites with long tails plunged and wiggled like tadpoles in the clear sky above the plain. He'd been thinking that in two or three years, he and Anan would fly kites together. Uh, and months go by before he sees his wife again. All right, it's uh, jumping way ahead to page. Um, 299, when they finally moved to Port of Spain, right, where he's going to become a, a newspaper um, uh, newspaper reporter, right, and where he's going to become like a tiger dad, right, <laughs> you know, where it's just relentlessly educating. This, you really see how they, you know, this, this value that's given to education, right, and, and to this family, uh, you know, and, that edu this education is a hell of a thing, Ranchman said. Any little child could pick it up. And the blasted thing does turn out so damn important later on. Right? And on the next page, seeing the sea for the first time. Right? These themes which just are the cartilage of this book. For Mr. Baswas, this was a moment of deep romance. He had seen the sea, but didn't know that Port of Spain was really a port in which ocean liners called from all parts of the world, always is beckoning. Right, have to get off the island, which of course Anand is going to be the one who, who does later by getting to, to Cambridge, right? 312, just little moments I liked where, oh, I don't know, I just thought this was really funny. When he goes on the ship, Mr. Biswas went aboard German ships, was given, you know, he's covering the port now for the, for the Sentinel, was given excellent lighters, saw photographs of Adolf Hitler and was be bewildered by the Heil Hitler salutes. Excitement, right? <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, and he interviews, a, uh, he, he interviews an English novelist, uh, a man about his own age, but still young and shining with success. And years later, Mr. Biswas came across the travel book the novelist had written about the region. He saw himself described as an incompetent, aggrieved, and fanatical young reporter 
who distastefully noted my guarded replies in a laborious longhand. That's an English snobbery, right? It's, um, well, 322, I, uh, the ice, uh, let's see, Mr. The ice cream scene, but we, uh, 332. 332. He becomes a reporter, right? He begins to become somebody in this world. Mr. Bezos is finally becoming, you know, becoming somebody in the world, right? And he actually has to even wear a suit every day. Encouraged by Shama, he took an increasing interest in his personal appearance. In his silk suit and tie, he had never ceased to surprise her by his elegance and respectability. And whenever she bought him anything, a shirt, cufflinks, a tie pin, he said, and this is a recurring motif throughout the book, going to buy that gold brooch for you, girl, one of these days. Sometimes, while he was dressing, he would make an inventory of all the things he was wearing and think with wonder that he was then worth $150. Once on the bicycle, he was worth about 180. And so he rode to his reporter's job in its curious status, welcomed, even fawned upon, by the greatest in the land, fed as well as anybody, and sometimes even better, yet always finally rejected. Um, again, this constant anxiety when the newspaper changes hands and everything's about to change again. The way it's just on a whim, you know, your life can be turned upside down. It's uh, getting to believe that by staying in the office, he was increasing the risk of dismissal. 354. Oh, 354. He left early and cycled home. Fear led to fear. Suppose he had to send the children back to Hunnaman House. Would there be anyone to receive them? Suppose Mrs. Tulsi gave him notice, as Shama did so often to the tenement people. Where would he go? How would he live? The years stretched the head dark. That fear all the time. When he got home, he mixed and drank some McLean's brand stomach powder. <laughs> and undressed, got into bed, and began to read Epistatus. Is that how you say it, Andre? Epistatus or Epictetus? Uh, Epictetus. Epictetus. Right? Epictetus. Um, one of the two books he's constantly turning to with Marco Aurelius. And this is one of the most significant little paragraphs in the book. It's always, it's kind of iconic for this book. And it's one that just, you know, when I say how tied and close to this book and how, how its obsessions of so, you know, you know, I just remember always thinking about my own father. I don't want to be like him. I don't want to be like you. No, and this is just constant. It's like a refrain. And in this book, this is a moment where the father says to the son, I don't want you to be like me. And where, uh, and later on in the book, there is a passage where the son actually thinks, you know, replies, I don't want to be like you, tells mm -hmm. his father, right? It's uh, uh, on page 359. He read, you know, by now, you know, we're beginning to see the emerging Anand, the emerging, you know, bright boy in school, the endless stu studier, the one who's destined to go on to this grand life, to go to Cambridge, to realize all, you know, all the leaves, by all the success and, and romance that his father is going to live through so vicariously later on. He read political books. They gave him phrases which he could only speak to himself and use on Shama. They also revealed one region after another of misery and injustice and left him feeling more helpless and more isolated than ever. Then it was that he discovered the solace of Dickens. Without difficulty, he transferred characters and settings to people and places he knew. In the, grotesques, in the grotesques of Dickens, everything he feared and suffered from was ridiculed and diminished, so that his own anger, his own contempt became unnecessary, and he was given strength to bear with the most difficult part of his day, dressing in the morning, that daily affirmation of faith in oneself, which at, which at times was for him almost like an act of sacrifice. He shared his discovery with Anand, and though he abstracted some of the pleasure of Dickens by making Anand write out and learn the meanings of difficult words, he did this not out of strictness or as a part of Anand's training. He said, I don't want you to be like me. Anand understood. Father and son, 
each saw the other as weak and vulnerable, and each felt a responsibility for the other, a responsibility which, in times of particular pain, was disguised by exaggerated authority on the one side, exaggerated respect on the other. So, you, know, you see, um, and you see just a few pages later at times, the incredible, um, for many days, Anand didn't speak to Mr. Biswas, and in secret revenge, didn't drink milk at the dairies, but iced coffee, right? He's supposed to drink milk for his. Mr. Biswas was effusive towards Savi and Mina and Kamla, and relaxed with Shama. The atmosphere in the house was less heavy, and Shama, now Anand's defender, took much pleasure in urging Anand to speak to his father. Leave him, leave him, Mr. Biswas said. Leave the storyteller. Anand became steadily more morose. When he came home after private lessons one afternoon, he refused to eat or talk. He went to his room, laid down on the bed, and despite Shama's coaxing, stayed there. Mr. Biswas, Biswas came in and presently walked into the room, saying in his rallying voice, well, well, what happened to our hands, Anderson? Right, I remember my father always wanted to mock my ambitions as a teenage writer. It was always like, what's up with our Hemingway, right? <laughs> you know, that's just sort of always just so embarrassing and humiliating. Um, Eat some prunes, son, Shama said, taking out the little brown paper bag from the table drawer. Mr. Biswa saw the distress on Anand's face and his manner changed. What's the matter, Anand said. The boys laugh at me. He who laughs last, laughs best, Chama said. Lawrence said that his father is your boss. There was silence. Mr. Biswas sat in the bed and said, Lawrence is the night editor, nothing to do with me. He say they have you like an office boy in the office. You know I write features. And he say that when you go to his father's house, you have to go to the back door. Mr. Biswas stood up. His linen suit was crumpled. The jacket pulled out of shape by the notebooks in the pockets, the tops of which were dirty and a little frayed. You never went to his father's house? Why should he go to Lawrence's house, Shama said. And you never went back to the back door? And you never went to the back door? Mr. Biswas walked to the window. It was dark. His back was to them. Let me put on the light, Shama said briskly. Her footsteps were heavy. The light went on. Anand covered his face with his arm. Is that all that's been upsetting you, Shama asked. Your father has nothing to do with Lawrence. You heard what he said. Mr. Biswas went out of the room. Shama said, you shouldn't have told him that, you know, son. Oh, so much going on in that scene, right? And without, you have to read it, right? You have to, you know, you know it's about racist humiliation, right? You know it's about a son the cruelty of a son waking up to his father's position in the world, the idolized father, um, Shama, interjections. You know, uh, it's just a beautiful scene. So much is conveyed and just through dialogue and action. I mean, he's such an uh, incredible um, a master at that. Uh, the, I'll just jump quickly to the very last pages. Anand's gone off to uh, Cambridge, all right? He's close to death. He's finally achieved his lifelong dream of this, this house. You know, it's just a, he missed Anand and worried about him. Uh, right, let's go up a paragraph above. You know, um, except the children. Suddenly the world opened for them. Savi got a scholarship and went abroad. Two years later, Anand got a scholarship and went to England. The prospects of repaying the debt receded. But Mr. Boswas, Mr. Biswas felt he could wait. At the end of five years, he could make other arrangements. He missed Anand and worried about him. Anand's letters, at first rate, at first rare, became more and more frequent. They were gloomy, self-pitying. Then they were tinged with hysteria, which Mr. Biswas immediately understood. He wrote Anand long, humorous letters. He wrote about the garden. He gave religious advice. At great expense, he sent by airmail a book called Outwitting Our Nerves by two American women psychologists. Anand's letters grew rare again. There was nothing Mr. Biswas could do but wait. Wait for Anand. Wait for Savi. Wait for the five years to come to an end. Wait, wait. Right. It's, uh, you know, and one of the reasons we know, um, you know, usually you don't, 
talk about it all in terms of its real life. Um, you know, you don't necessarily always see a book that's so autobiographical, right? But of course, we know that this book actually <laughs> really is. And, uh, and one of the reasons we know that is that, um, and it's not what makes the book great. We don't need to know that, right? The book is so extraordinary, but it's just, you know, there's just this, this uh, those letters here first at the end, of course, all have been correct, connect, collected in this extraordinary volume, this, heart, this you know, V.S. Naipaul between father and son family letters, right? It was just the most extraordinary, uh, which is just, um, you know, you hear Mr. Biswas's voice, you know, throughout this book. Um, the father is not quite as, as comical a figure, but you get the same uh, a marvelous combination of innocence, desire for worldliness, overbearing love, uh, 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 you know, that um, uh, a smotheringness, right? Hectoring, the, all those things that he does. I'll just a quick little example. Um, you know, you know, living vicariously through what, through what his children do also, but trying to always to be, you know, it, you know intrusively encouraging always, right? Um, I see, you know, this is one of the father's letters to, him, to, to young Vidya, as he was called, while he was in Cambridge studying and trying to become a novelist, and actually wrote two novels in the years he was at Cambridge. I see Seldon has had a novel accepted by the Wingbait Publishing House, and it has been recommended by the British Book Society as its book of the month, Lucky Fellow. The book, entitled The Brighter Sun, deals with a marriage of two teenage Indian children in Trinidad. My own idea. And I doubt whether Selva knows really much of the realities of the Indian way of life in these parts. I don't mind admitting that the thing depressed me. I feel very foolishly, of course, that I have been robbed of my theme. Are you writing some short stories? You should, you know. This Selvan success is likely to make me do some work, too. I am so sure I could write anything as good as Selvan can. Ba, 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 ba. You promised to send a letter a week, but you are not doing so. If you, were all, if you would all start a letter, you will dash it off quickly enough, just touching on your events of the day or even of the hour. Your mommy has been telling your ma about how the English girls are having the West Indian boys dancing on their girls' fingers, and your ma is worrying a lot. She thinks you may, go, you may go and get yourself married to a white girl, and she would like you to marry no one but an Indian. Your mommy has told her there are Lots of Indian girls from Trinidad, Trinidad studying in England. If an investigation were made, it would show that by far the majority of intermarriages end in failure. Keep out of the mess. Your affectionate pa. <laughs> like just letter, you know, days of letters like this. It must have been maddening. <laughs> um, the, you know, just these letters themselves constitute kind of an extraordinary homage to the book of war. You know, and Naipaul himself has said, he, you know, Naipaul is famously curmudgeonly, right? <laughs> I think he's done brilliant writing in his curmudgeonly years. I, one of my favorite books, for instance, is uh, The Enigma of Arrival, which is, couldn't be more different in tone. Though there's always this nostalgia for that journey, that original journey. This <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>